Uh, our next talk is on translational advances in the management of acute spinal cord injury. What is new? What is hot? By Dr. Michael Feelings. Good morning. Well, it's a privilege uh, to follow Professor Oldfield and to uh, address you this morning at the Congress of Neurological Surgeons. So I've been asked to kind of give you a snapshot update of uh, what, what's new, what's hot in, uh, in, in, in spinal cord injury, what would be of interest to you as, uh, as practicing uh, neurosurgeons. Well, in a nutshell, we're in a remarkable uh, era of regenerative neuroscience and where we're seeing the benefits of two decades of translational research and where this is now uh, starting to impact our, our patients, and I want to share some of this excitement uh, uh, with you. What I'm going to talk about are some of the neuroprotective uh, approaches, including the role of, uh, of surgery and timing matters. I'll briefly describe uh, some of the uh, uh, trials with neuroprotective uh, agents, focusing um, on a trial that I'm leading with the sodium glutamate antagonist, uh, Riluzole briefly talk about a, a cool concept, which is uh, epidural stimulation of the lumbar central pattern generator to uh, uh, improve uh, locomotion after chronic spinal cord injury. We've heard a lot of discussion around adv uh, potential advances with stem cells, and I'll, I'll just briefly uh, uh, give you uh, perhaps a perspective on, on that. I'll talk briefly about uh, biomaterials and, in particular, bioengineered uh, scaffolds that I think uh, represent uh, an, an exciting adjunctive approach to regenerative neuroscience and, and also share with you some of the excitement around what I've referred to as biologics, in particular um, an exciting phase three randomized trial that is, has just started with a C3 uh, rho in, inhibitor, this is VX210, and then I'll also uh, uh, d uh, discuss some emerging efforts uh, to block the uh, no-go uh, inhibitory molecule. A few years ago, we uh, completed a, uh, an international multicenter trial, which we called STASCUS. This was um, the surgical time and acute spinal cord injury uh, study. Uh, the table um, on this slide just, uh, is a snapshot of the key result, which illustrates that uh, early surgical decompression within 24 hours of the injury is associated with um, uh, a 2.8-fold increase in the odds of a substantial neurologic recovery, which here represented two or more uh, Asia grades, so quite a large recovery. So what, did this, what does this mean? Well, it means that we've um, made a bump in the trajectory of recovery of people with a traumatic spinal cord injury, but in addition, we now have the opportunity to A, surgically access the spinal cord which is cool from the delivery of biologics or biomaterials, but also to alter the milieu for potential recovery and to have a more sensible approach to the adjunctive use of some of the therapeutic strategies that I've described. So this is a short list of uh, some of the emerging neuroprotective strategies for acute spinal cord injury. The three compounds in green are currently in uh, randomized control trials. Um, uh, magnesium PEG and FGF2 start at the phase one level, but um, these, were, uh, these, were, these were discontinued. Uh, this is a um, uh, paper in uh, brain. This was the phase two uh, placebo-controlled RCT of minocycline. Minocycline is an anti-inflammatory uh, drug, um, and it's actually a matrix metalloproteinase uh, in inhibitor. This was uh, done by the Calgary group. And what they found in this uh, paper in, in uh, brain, then particularly with uh, patients with cervical injuries, and especially those with an incomplete cervical injury, that it appeared that the trajectory of recovery uh, was improved. It didn't achieve statistical significance, but the results were compelling enough uh, to warrant um, a phase three uh, trial, which is currently uh, underway, results pending. The Miami uh, uh, group in particular has championed uh, the use of a uh, potential treatment strategy that has been with us for decades, the concept of uh, trying to cool 
um, uh, the injured central nervous system. We've seen the attempted application of this in brain injury. We've seen the successful application of this um, in anoxic um, uh, ischemic uh, 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 deficits. And uh, there are some early phase uh, clinical trials to suggest the safety uh, of, of this. And there are efforts underway to try to translate this into a formal uh, randomized uh, 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 trial. And I await this work with great interest. Uh, this is um, uh, uh, the a summary of our uh, phase 1, 2A trial results using Riluzole. Riluzole is a sodium glutamate antagonist. It's used um, uh, on an on-label application in patients with ALS to slow down the rate of nerve cell degeneration. And in this uh, matched prospective cohort-controlled study, we found significant improvements in the rate of Asia conversion, as well as uh, significant improvements, particularly in uh, patients with a cervical cord injury, where we're able to eloquently assess motor improvements in the upper extremity. This film will just briefly uh, illustrate the concept that we're pursuing in the RISCUS trial. We're studying patients with a cervical cord injury. Here we're modeling a subaxial a cervical burst fracture. There's amplification of the primary injury through mechanisms of secondary uh, injury. One of the key events that occurs is the early influx of sodium through voltage-gated sodium channels. This then prompts the intracellular um, uh, delivery of calcium through the sodium calcium exchanger and the pathologic release of glutamate. And this uh, causes excitotoxic cell injury. So these are the critical secondary injury events that occur after ischemic and traumatic nerve cell injury. Riluzole specifically blocks non-inactivating sodium channels. What we're assessing in the RISCUS trial are patients with subaxial cervical injuries these patients have early surgical intervention following the principles of the Staskus trial and then are receiving early intervention with Riluzole within 12 hours after injury. And the concept uh, that we're trying to pursue is whether the adjunctive use of early surgical decompression with this promising neuroprotective agent can augment the recovery in these critically ill patients. So the phase three trial has been launched. It's called the RISCUS uh, trial. To date, 56 patients have been uh, in, enrolled, and this represents a partnership uh, between uh, a number of uh, NGOs and granting uh, bodies. Epidural stimulation is an exciting uh, uh, approach where, again, neurosurgeons are involved. And this is using an existing technology, namely the use of a dorsal column stimulator, which is used for neuropathic pain. Except here, it's being applied over the lumbosacral enlargement. This is the area of the so-called central pattern generator of, of the uh, spinal cord, which, when stimulated, can evoke a locomotor uh, movement. And in the bottom uh, of this uh, slide are EMG uh, records in a quadriplegic individual where uh, such um, locomotor movements um, have been uh, elicited. And this is from the Lancet paper by Susan Harkema and colleagues from uh, Louisville uh, as in conjunction with uh, Reggie Edgerton's group at uh, UCLA. And this is currently um, in an early phase a clinical trial in patients with a chronic cervical cord uh, uh, injury. And the results from uh, this larger uh, uh, trial are pending, but certainly a very exciting and, and a hopeful a trial for patients with a chronic injury. And again, another circumstance of where neurosurgeons are being involved in the application of regenerative uh, technologies. So we've heard about uh, stem cells and cellular-based uh, strategies, and we've really seen a shift from where these types of strategies were, were really the subject of medical tourism to where these are now being in, in, investigated in, in FDA-sponsored uh, uh, um, uh, uh, trials under uh, rigorous uh, uh, circumstances. And I want to particularly focus on uh, Schwann cells and neural stem cells because uh, these two uh, strategies are being uh, investigated quite actively in the context of spinal cord injury. 
Now, stem cells, as we've heard, vary in, in, their, in their type. And bone marrow-derived stem cells likely uh, work uh, principally uh, by releasing growth factors and having paracrine uh, effects, as we heard uh, very eloquently uh, uh, this morning by Dr. Steinberg. Neural stem cells, uh, in contrast, likely principally mediate their effect through cell replacement, but may also uh, liberate uh, growth factors and may modify the environment by reducing glial scarring. This film will illustrate uh, the concept of neural stem cells promoting remyelination. So here, of course, we have the white matter uh, tracts, we have the oligodendrocytes that myelinate, usually four to five axons. We have the nerve signals which are propagated through sodium channels at the nodes of Ranvier. There's a precise um, uh, uh, molecular organization of the nodes of Ranvier in the paranodal uh, regions. The myelin is attached to the axon through adhesion molecules such as Casper. After traumatic spinal cord injury, there's typically a central hemorrhagic necrosis that occurs in the gray matter and the mesial white matter. And often there's a thin subpeal rim of white matter that's preserved. The problem, though, is that the oligodendrocytes undergo a secondary programmed a cell death, and there's a loss of the myelin with incomplete remyelination. And as a result, there's an altered molecular configuration of the nodes of Ranvier, and this results in exonal conduction block. So the concept uh, that is being pursued by a number of groups is using the intrinsic spinal cord as a scaffold and then uh, uh, injecting the neural stem cells. And the neural stem cells love the white matter niche. And they're very good at migrating along the white matter uh, niche. And then remarkably, um, these um, neural stem cells will propagate into oligodendrocytes pathfind their way along the axons and can remyelinate these uh, axons. This is one of the principal um, uh, approaches being used currently in the context of spinal cord injury. And this is being applied now using a peripheral glial cell, uh, the Schwann cell. Uh, this is uh, uh, some uh, work by Takami et al. in Journal of Neuroscience. And this builds on, on the um, exciting work that had been um, initially championed by Richard uh, Bungie when he um, was alive and uh, leading the Miami uh, project and is now being moved forward uh, by, um, by that group. And this is currently in uh, two early phase clinical uh, uh, trials. Neural stem cells have been uh, the subject of a number of translational uh, efforts, and we heard uh, uh, this morning Alan Levy uh, eloquently uh, summarize uh, one of the uh, phase one uh, trial uh, results. And there have been some challenges. We, we saw that uh, uh, Geron and now most recently uh, Stem Cell Inc. Have, um, have struggled from a financial perspective. But nonetheless, the proof of concept has been established. It's safe, it's feasible, and there's a suggestion of a potential um, early biologic results. And trials are continuing uh, to move forward in this arena. As a complementary strategy, uh, this morning I presented very uh, initial uh, uh, observations in the first eight patients who were transplanted with this PLGA biomaterial uh, scaffold. And this is, uh, takes advantage of the, uh, of the exciting work of uh, Bob Langer at, at MIT. And the concept here is very sound. Spinal cord injury results in a central loss of tissue. There are often uh, cysts. There's a glial scar. So the idea being to use a conduit that, that can bridge uh, this tissue gap and also potentially modify the surrounding environment through the upregulation of permissive molecules such as laminin, as is illustrated in this uh, immunophotomicrograph. And again, based on sound data, including primate data, and in a fascinating uh, uh, set of uh, uh, experiments from this PNES uh, paper, uh, these scaffolds are complementary to neural stem cells. And wouldn't it be exciting if one day we could actually use a combinatorial approach to bring these regenerative strategies uh, together. And this is, as I presented this morning, in an early phase clinical trial. 
But what about the challenge of the chronic injury? Here is a uh, photomicrograph of a, a post-mortem uh, section through a patient with a chronic spinal cord injury. It shows centrally the myelomalacia, the loss of the tissue. This is surrounded by uh, the glial scar. And there's an upregulation of a number of inhibitory uh, molecules that pre prevent central nervous system regeneration or plasticity. And this cartoon very simply illustrates some of these key uh, factors. In the myelin uh, debris, uh, there are various factors expressed, including no-go, oligodendrocyte myelin glycoprotein, and MAG. These uh, trigger uh, the uh, NGR receptor, which then um, leads to a downstream pathway principally mediated uh, by a rho, which is a key signaling uh, switch. And the activation of rho results in collapse of the axonal growth cone, and it also mediates an important pathway for a cell death. So there have been efforts uh, led by uh, Martin Schwab and, and colleagues, more recently Armin Kurt in Zurich, to look at an anti-no-go antibody. And this is a targeting a, one of the uh, key inhibitory uh, molecules. This is from Patrick Freund's paper in Nature uh, Medicine, uh, showing a recovery of, of the primate uh, uh, forepaw, significant recovery of upper extremity function, and the bottom right camera lucida drawings uh, showing significant axonal uh, plasticity. It's an initial phase clinical trial, the results of which have not been uh, uh, reported, and um, the most recent indications are that Armin Kurt is attempting to move this uh, forward into a next phase uh, clinical trial. VX210, or as it was previously referred to as Cethrin, is a recombinant protein Rho GTPase inhibitor, and I had the privilege of having a long-standing collaboration with the inventor of this, Lisa McCarricker, when she was at the University of Montreal, and um, I've been helping her try to translate this forward into trials. VX210 is added in a fibrin a sealant, and it penetrates the spinal cord uh, tissue through a special um, uh, a, a tissue penetration a sequence that's added to the molecule. And the concept of delivery is pretty cool. It's very simple. Uh, uh, we uh, surgically decompress the spinal cord, which is now part of the standard of care of the management of patients with spinal cord injury. And this is actually delivered extradurally. And remarkably, uh, the um, uh, preclinical animal experiments show an excellent penetration into the uh, spinal cord uh, uh, tissue. This is the results from the phase 1-2A trial previously reported, uh, showing very promising results, particularly in the cervical uh, patients with a dose-dependent uh, improvement in function. And this is now, has just recently uh, been launched um, in a phase 3 randomized control trial. So what I've tried to summarize for you are some of the activity occurring in a traumatic spinal cord injury. We truly are in a remarkable uh, uh, era. As neurosurgeons, we have a significant role uh, to play in terms of optimizing the milieu of recovery with early, reco with, uh, early surgical intervention. There are a number of exciting neuroprotective strategies that are being uh, uh, tested. And I've tried to summarize uh, uh, some of the other strategies, including epidural stimulation, neural stem cells, some of the biomaterial-based approaches, and some of the exciting biologic strategies. Thank you very much.